have anything to do with the no, with the calcium that we have to uh, okay. wrap it up. Wrap it up, okay. So um, I'm, I'm trying to quickly present this this last um, example. This is a, a a clinical trial going on. Not every clinical trial ends in a happy ending, so I wanted to present um, a, a important um, a, a study that, or a group of studies that essentially tell us that we need to understand the mechanism before we can develop trials. So cholesterol ester transfer protein is um, a, a transporter that ultimately helps with, um, with the exchange of cholesterol from HDL to other mother proteins. And inhibiting that actually prevents cholesterol from leaving HDL. So that's the slide that I was talking slide, about. Yeah. yeah. So um, this was a therapy where maybe everyone thought, you know, HDL cholesterol is correlated with, um, uh, inversely, with um, CAR disease. So in observational studies, we've seen that those with the highest HDL also have um, the lowest risk. And so the, the idea was, hey, how would we just increase the HDL cholesterol and, and um, improve outcomes in these patients. Um, and, you know, so the, they, that, that was the, 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 uh, the hypothesis was as simple as that. Just increase HDL cholesterol and you can improve outcomes. So this was a, a therapy. We can do this through, through an inhibition of CETP. It's cholesterol as a transfer protein. So Dow Center Group was a, a CETP inhibitor. It only increased HDL um, by, you know, several milligrams per deciliter. Had no effect on LDL. <coughs> And um, what you know, what, what happens when we do that? So we see in this, this is the cardiovascular outcome result. We see that the, the therapy is no different than placebo. There's no, there's no separation here. It's, it was just as effective or ineffective as placebo in reducing cardiovascular outcomes. So there was another, another um, trial, and a central paper with another CETP inhibitor. We see similar results, although we do see separation we do see a, a modest reduction in cardiovascular outcomes towards the, you know, the right around two and a half years we see this separation, about a 9% reduction, um, very modest. So the question is why is there a little bit of a difference? So actually if you look further into the mechanism, you can see that HDL was increased, similar to the doxycycline period. So that may, may not be explained what's going on, but you actually see that the non-HDL, the LDLs and other, other atherogenic proteins were actually reduced. And that they, the experts believe that, that the, the separation attributable to the reduction in this atherogenic cholesterol rather than the increase in HDL. And so um, ultimately, this, this uh, study um, was an important lesson learned that, you know, basically going back to the school bus analogy, increasing the amount of kids in the school bus um, is essentially going to prevent, if anything, is going to prevent other kids from getting on the, the school bus um, if, you don't, if you don't offload it. And it's a you know, great lesson learned. The expense of several billions of dollars. But the CETP inhibitors are no longer a class that are being, um, I, don't, I don't believe that any, any drug companies are, using, are, are targeting this pathway to, to reduce cardiovascular disease. So, in terms of other therapies, we have, um, we have there's basically two mechanisms to improve efflux. One is to increase the amount of HDL particles. We have a lot of therapies currently in the pipeline in the early stages um, for doing that. And, and finally, the upregulation of, of the macrophage. When I talked about the, the leukocytes, the, the white blood cells, um, we can do that through the upregulation of some of these uh, some of these uh, intracellular um, mediators. And, and so, you know, like I said, these are in the early stages of development. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly end by summarizing all the emerging therapies. You know, the lipid lowering um, therapies are for so long. We know that there's therapies already in the market, stands, et cetera. And, but there's still a lot of pathways, a lot of avenues for further um, reducing uh, cardiovascular um, endpoints. If we the next along, we have the, the Cantos trial. Canakinumab is essentially um, should be approved in the next couple of years for heart disease. And, um, and then in terms of cholesterol reflux strategies, these are in the early stages, uh, but this shift should focus, the field should really focus on promoting reverse cholesterol transport and cholesterol efflux rather than increasing HDL cholesterol levels. Um, and importantly, some of these inflammatory and some of these markers that we looked at the pre-beta um, are also, can help us to determine if a specific patient has a, a lipid disorder, what pathway is this functional? And we can use this to maybe select from all of these therapies and determine which, which patients should receive which therapies. And that's kind of the precision medicine approach. That essentially you know, we treat the patient as opposed to the, the disease. Do we have more time? Um, anything else you want to say, Chris? Yeah, I, so I was just going to present uh, two big PCSK9 trials.
trials. So PCSK9, we've been talking about it a lot, but it stands for Pro-Protein Converting Septolysin Kexin Type 9 Inhibitor. And so it's that little oh, protein that's right there. Um, and what happens when you inhibit this protein is that it prevents it from binding to your LDL receptors on the liver. So that receptor can stay on the liver for a longer amount of time to bind to that LDL, which then decreases the amount of LDL in blood. So that's basically what we're looking at when we're talking about the PCSK9 inhibitors. So you may see that PCSK PCSK9 inhibitors are um, associated with a lot of side effects, but in clinical trials, this is everything that happened, so it had to be reported. But the significant side effects that really occurred were, one, injection site reactions, because it is a under-the-skin injection. And then two, with polyunit, they saw slightly more myalgias or muscle pain in the patients. So really, this is not very common for you to see all these different side effects. So the two big trials that I really wanted to talk about were the four-year trial, which was for um, ebolopumab, and then the Odyssey trial, which hasn't been published in terms of the cardiovascular outcomes, but there have been some results presented um, back in March of this year. And so they were both very large trials. The four-year trial had over 27,000 patients. The Odyssey trial had over 18,000 patients. And they were put on PCSK9 inhibitors a majority of the patients, over 90%, were on moderate to high intensity statins, plus or minus Zetia. So in four years, it was about 5% of the patients that were on Zetia, and in Odyssey, it was about 12% of patients that were on Zetia. And this was for secondary prevention. So they either had an MI in the past, peripheral artery disease, coronary artery, artery disease, already on statin, and then plus um, a PCSK9 inhibitor or placebo for both of these two trials. So the main differences that I wanted to point out in Fourier for the cardiovascular outcomes, they did not show any benefit in terms of cardiovascular mortality. Um, however, in the Odyssey trial, this was from the presentation in March, they did show um, a significant difference in terms of cardiovascular mortality, but specifically when they did the subgroup analysis in those patients with LDL levels of 100 or greater. So that they actually showed an absolute risk reduction of 0.6% difference in those patients. So for the patients in the 50 to 100 LDL, it's not recommended, is that what you just said? It's not that it's not recommended, it didn't have a significant difference in terms of mortality benefit, but there was still benefit in terms of coronary revascularization or non-fatal heart attack or stroke. So once a patient is prescribed a PCSK9 inhibitor, the prescriber will notify our PA team, which consists of nurses and pharmacists, and what we will then do is start to gather data and information from that patient's file, submit the PA, which the turnaround has gotten a lot faster. It could be within a week that the PA is approved. Um, if it doesn't get approved, we'll receive notification of a denial in which then we will write a letter, have Dr. Stock or another cardiologist support the letter, sign it, and we'll send that appeal in. Um, sometimes we go as far as a second denial letter, and sometimes even that second denial letter or that second appeal letter gets denied, and then we have to do a peer-to-peer -peer between the physician and the insurance company. Um, and more often than not, we do successfully get the medications approved for our patients. So after that gets approved, we will work, either the nurses or the pharmacists will work with the pharmacy to make sure they have the medication in stock, that it's not a specialty pharmacy that the patient has to get it from. We'll call the patient to provide counseling, recommend videos if they're more visual to teach them how to use the injection. And then the patient will start the PCSK9 inhibitor and we will do monitoring after three to four doses, which is about one and a half to two months. Right. And there's a variety of support services available to the patients, including live nurses to ask questions, training videos, copy cards, and also needle disposal kits for the patients. And then really briefly, I just wanted to talk about our efforts in trying to um, characterize our UCSF PCSK9 inhibitor population. So currently, we have about 195 patients who have been prescribed PCSK9 inhibitors, um, probably and Amrapaca combined. 
and 45% of them are on statins. So this is very different from our clinical trial populations where over 95% of the patients are on statins. For our patients, most of them, the other 55% um, are statin intolerant. They either have hair loss, myalgias to statins, and they just do not want to be on a statin anymore. Um, most of our cardiology and endocrine departments are prescribing these PCSK9 inhibitors, but as you can see, we also have a variety of department, um, departments also prescribing them, ranging from neurology to internal medicine. And then during our initial chart screen of 10 patients, seven of those patients had successfully gotten their PCSK9 inhibitors, so we're predicting out of the 195, about 130 of them are successfully on their PCSK9 inhibitors. All right, so we don't have to go over this. It's just another patient case. All right. So for this audience, uh, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Barr. So I have a good question. So we're sitting here and we have healthcare professionals. <laughs> we're concerned about patients, and then we have people who are attending this meeting. What are the take-home messages that we have today? In other words, right now, I, we see patients. <clears throat> we do standard lipid uh, analysis on those individuals, and if it explains their risk based on diabetes or LDL or HDL, then we begin treatment at that point with a standard lipid panel. In the cases where we have unexplained atherosclerosis, and we don't see it in the LDL or in the HDL or in their diabetes or other risk factors, that's when we go out and look at a CRP or a LP little a and obtain that, or we consider looking at HDL, is it the good HDL or the bad HDL? Is that adequate for most of our patients, or should we be getting a CRP in everyone that is walking around with atherosclerotic disease or risk for it? And should we be getting a pre-beta HDL in everyone? Should we get an LP, a little a in everyone? What are you recommending? Because right now, we're only using it for a small number of individuals, less than 10%, where we can't otherwise explain their atherosclerotic risk. All right, well, thank you for that question. I think that boils it down to what um, <clears throat> is really important to um, emphasize here. And it is that we have a big population walking around with unknown coronary disease or unknown risk factors, right? We have also a big population with risk factors that we're trying to you know, bring in and treat so that their coronary disease has better outcomes. As I mentioned, and I think my third slide, slide, prevention is far better than treating something once it happens. So my take home message would be, go for it, go look for it. Paul Ritker already gave us data in the Jupiter trial. Healthy people with high CRP are at risk. So we need to find them. We need to find these people. We need to find out why. Maybe it's that they have trans fatty acids in their blood. Maybe it's just that they you know, have undiagnosed inflammatory diseases. Maybe they're just at risk, but we need to know. We need to treat it. There's no excuse for not getting an LP little a in my mind because it's a one-time test. One time, it's not expensive, and you'll know if your patient is at risk. And so both of these, I think, are easy enough. They're non-invasive, they're cheap. Um, and I think that we have data to do well in this population. The other question is, um, will these people do better? I think they will. If you tell somebody that is at the beginning, you know, in their early 20s or 30s, and we educate early, we can prevent a lot of this. If you know you have a high CRP and high LPA, most of my patients, they will go, oh my god, what can I do? So they, they're on board. And um, we are, 
coming up with therapies that are better, we're coming up with algorithms that are better to predict. So my take home would be, yes, let's use these things that we have readily available, the, the, the LP little a for sure, the CRP, um, you can, the, there's evidence also from the um, Physician's Health Study that the elevations of CRP precede coronary disease by many years. So you have time, you have time to prevent this. So that would be my take home. And uh, pre-beta HDL uh, on everyone or not? So pre-beta HDL, I would recommend in people with coronary disease because it's a mechanism um, that we don't have a good intervention for yet. Right? So um, if you have a big family history and you're trying to see if that's the mechanism, you could do it in an asymptomatic patient and we have people with very high prenatal and HDLs with family histories. But it's mostly for the unexplained coronary disease that we're using it right now. It's an excellent tool for that, in the sense of explaining. And then uh, what we do about it is the question. Uh, we have some thoughts about increasing the release of these cholesterol esters from the lysosomes, sort of using these um, enzymes that could help the body liberate cholesterol esters. There's some things we could do, but not in our own right now. And how cheap is the HPAA? The LP little a? Yeah. It's like a uh, cholesterol test. 15, 20 bucks. Right. It's not more than that. And, you know, sometimes it gets denied by health insurance, but most insurance carriers, I mean, my patients haven't complained that much about it. Does anybody else here do it? And what's your experience? No? I think I should. So you were saying in our pre meeting that the LP Do you have a threshold uh, that you uh, 
the above which you intervene more for the LTL display other than just the aspirin and lower the LTL? So the higher the level, the more the risk. So the threshold is about 75 where your risk starts to increase significantly. So I just, whoever has the highest, I tend to take those people into the lower than 70 for prevention. If it's only moderately, modestly, less than 100 maybe would be adequate. But um, I think we need more uh, studies and more people so that we can, clearly define if we should do it. I don't see why not do it when people are born, but there might be a lot of you know, policy implications for that, but it could be done in court blood, just so that you know. Thank you. You did mention one other entity where you <coughs> have an absorption uh, in the intestine. And uh, you were able to block it with uh, a drug, uh, <laughs> zetamide. Um, I guess the question is, is there a test for that now to determine it? Or is the easiest thing to just put someone who's at high risk or has atherosclerotic disease on zetamide and then see what the change in LDL is? Because typically in those patients, the average patient they lower their LDL about 17%, so that if you saw a 80% reduction, you would say maybe they're that uh, candidate. Yeah, you could do it. You could do it that way, do sort of a biological trial, right? Just put the person on and see how they respond. You could do that effectively. Um, if you really wanted to know, you could do the plasma sterols. They are easy. You just need to be fasting for it. Mayo Clinic does it, Boston Heart Diagnostics does it, and I'm sure there's other labs out there. I could get a list for you. And, um, the UCSF doesn't have currently a lab that does it, but we should, we should, we can do that. I think it, if it gets um, you know, used enough, I think we should offer it. Because it's what medicine is moving towards, precision medicine, right? You want the right treatment for the right patient. Avoid these trial and error. So it's also the SLCO1B1 mutation is to determine which peoples are more likely to have statin intolerance. It's a um, liver uh, protein that metabolizes the statin. So if you have the mutation, you're from if you have one allele mutated, you're five times more likely to get side effects. If you have both, 17 times more. So to avoid suffering, <laughs> you can do the local 1B1 mutation and prevent that in your patients. And instead of using Lipitor or Simba, you could use Crest or Pravastatin, Fluvastatin, Pitevastatin, and have at a low or moderate doses that So one of the questions was elephant in the room cost for this because <clears throat> we're talking about it. Well, I think as uh, she mentioned, the cost for some of these screening tests is under $100. And uh, in many cases, CRP $20, something like that. So a very reasonable cost, not too much at that point. The question is, once we identify a higher risk individual, how about treatment? The good news is, Every statin, which is an, a usual therapy in many cases, is generic at this time, and those costs are literally less than $10 a month for that. Um, some of the other, the plasmapheresis, very expensive, $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year. The PCSK9s came out three years ago at an annual cost of $14,400, but as of July 1st this year, the price will plummet down to $4,500 or $4,500 to $5,800 a year at that point in time. So that's a 
threefold uh, uh, reduction or 60% reduction in the cost of that, and that may allow that those individuals who do not respond to statins adequately or can't tolerate it to consider that, as well as the, let's say, the, the hurdles that were put up initially by the carriers to get coverage, where I can tell you initially I had 80% reject, rejection on PCSK9s, and then after appeal and reappeal, et cetera, it was still like 50%. The promise is that, and there is an agreement with, let's say, Express Scripts and a couple other companies to eliminate the documentation requirement to get what's called prior authorization for that, to simplify that based on some mortality data and outcomes data that is there, but also primarily on the dramatic reduction in cost, uh, a threefold reduction in cost at that time. So maybe these things will start to uh, uh, come in. I was told that it was all because of Donald Trump and he was able to negotiate the price down at that point in time. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, this afternoon's negotiations as well. Uh, but lastly, uh, we have handed out a pledge card for everybody just to pick up. Do you, are you doing your diligence, diet, exercise, and everything else? I personally have violated that pledge card because I've been sitting here for two hours, and I owe 30 minutes of exercise after I leave this program, and I thought, and I hope all of us share that uh, that guilt with me, and will, uh, and help me overcome it uh, in general. But I want to thank our speakers for an excellent presentation here. Thank everyone for coming today, and, uh, and go out and have some fun and exercise as well. Thank you for coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.